here with the lecture. Okay. Um, so, um, as I said, this week is really devoted towards getting getting you on a firm firm, uh, firm footing to try to start your projects. Um, and today's lecture, and probably a little bit of what we talk about on Thursday, will be designed uh, to do exactly that. The material I put together for today's lecture um, really um, lies at the heart of uh, of uh, the need for modeling, um, the use of modeling, and pragmatic pursuit of modeling. And um, it's a collection of imperatives, um, best practices, um, uh, reflections um, on, uh, on, on uh, needs for ongoing processes during modeling, and a set of other material that you know, it, it's sort of built on accreted wisdom over my 30 some odd years of 30, uh, 35 years of modeling. And um, I've tried to organize it better today than it, it has been presented previously in any of my boot camps or, or other courses. The material today um, focuses on model conceptualization and formulation. This is a subject which extends across all types of dynamic model, a subject whose importance extends across those, but whose, um, whose utter urgency and importance uh, is outsized when it comes to agent-based modeling. A failure to, to apply many of the principles discussed um, and highlighted here can much more readily lead to the failure of an agent-based modeling project than it's likely to do for a um, for a system dynamics or compartmental project, for example, because of um, because the strengths of the agent-based platform can turn into its weaknesses in terms of um, the ease of of adding components into it. So I hope. Although there may be components of today's discussion that will seem a bit abstract, I hope you'll take them to heart. Um, uh, and uh, you know, a, a willingness to do so can get you a lot further down the path towards delivering reliably on age-based modeling projects. So let's get started. Um, uh, now, um, thus far in this class, we've uh, only seen a limited number of agent-based models. And um, if I had my druthers, I at this point would do a walkthrough of a richer agent-based model. I think what I will do is point you to a video for such a walkthrough, which you can view in, the, in, in your own leisure, um, at your own leisure. But um, for now, I'm going to jump in therefore to to a to a set of slides on these on this subject. Bear in mind that I'll try to get you some illustrations of some of these points for your interactive exploration, um, separate outside of lecture, and in a way that won't um, uh, so circumscribe our time together that it it undercuts uh, the completeness of the messages. So. A very important, there's going to be a set of really important messages coming out of, of this lecture. And I'll try to highlight those key points. But one of the most important ones for those new to modeling is a kind of map of the modeling process. Um, modeling approaches, dynamic modeling approaches, differ widely in the attention that they pay to reflectively or reflexively to their own processes. Um, and I think in agent-based modeling, um, it, it's certainly not the strongest of the dominant forms of system science in reflecting on its own uh, process traditionally. I've tried to, to map this out though in a form that really aligns with many other spheres of dynamic modeling. And broadly, it proceeds in an iterative fashion from 
the left to the right, from problem conceptualization to a phase of qualitative problem mapping, where we're sort of sketching out some ideas of how things are related. So problem conceptualization is what's the scope in the model? What does it include? What does it include in a generative fashion? What does it include in a pre-specified fashion? What does it omit? Qualitative problem mapping, by contrast, um, starts to, to explore ideas of ways that different components are connected. Um, certain variables might influence other variables, uh, for example, not in, in their specifics, but but the dependencies, what in my, in my thinking and what I'm gonna capture in the model will be influencing what other thing and, and capturing structures associated with that. Um, you know, the, the, the structures that might be associated with, for example, given, given this class's inception, um, uh, natural history of infection or attitudes towards care seeking or uh, levels of, of, of mental health distress associated with suicidal ideation or what have you. That's qualitative problem mapping. We, we don't have any quantitative um, relationships yet, but we're starting to sketch out what might depend on what. Model formulation stage, which I've really combined, and I, probably I should refine this diagram, um, uh, to, to have a two stages here. Model formulation really comes up with a, an unambiguous um, design for the model about how we want things and in, in specifics to fit together. And then a model implementation stage will implement that. Often these are collapsed and certain types of modeling like system dynamics because model implementation is taken care of by the framework. In agent-based modeling, modeling implementation is actually um, quite um, fruitfully undertaken distinct from model formulation. Model formulation is coming up with the design of the model and a concrete plan and model implementation realizes that design. We'll come back to that distinction. Model calibration aligns the model with data and often um, it's combined and you could argue about the ordering of these with model testing testing the model for adequacy of accounting for the evidence base, lived experience, data, et cetera. Um, and, and generally aligning the model and ensuring that it matches up adequately against empirical data. And then often there's, there's uses of the model. And I include here as an example, policy evaluation, but it could be you know, uh, projections forward, for example, or analyses to help you understand imperatives for data collection. Some quantitative use of the model, scenario-based examination more generally is, is sort of there on the right. And then sort of knowledge translation for model. And what I wanna emphasize especially is these reverse arrows, these arrows in the reverse direction. It is an iterative process. It needs to be an iterative process because at each of these stages, important learning goes on. Key learning, for example, takes place in the model calibration phase that may lead you to go back and re-examine model conceptualization. Um, what you discover in terms of scenarios may cause you to re-examine some aspects of your model formulation. So there's kind of a back and forth. And I wanna highlight that what's really the most important thing here is often not the model that, that emerges, but the modeling process and, and the refinement of your mental model. And, and it's not just our own mental model, it's collective understanding of these issues that's, um, that gels in a good modeling team. Um, in an interdisciplinary modeling team, you're bringing everyone's mental models along in a in a key in a key way, you bring along institutional understanding. Now, another way to express this, um, this is something that I just put together for our boot camp um, a couple of weeks ago, of which some of you on this call I know partook, um, and many of you in this room. Um, and here I divide. Um, some stages of that process, and particularly this area here, where we're going involving model um, model 
problem conceptualization through model formulation into three to three stages. Model conceptualization, which um, really involves determining the scope, um, et cetera. Probably there should be a model mapping here. But then as you as you use certain tools, you start to become mathematically specific about the design of the model. You're going to math model formulation. You're taking it out of the realm of broad, what's in the model, what's out, what's generated, what's what's pre-specified, um, taking out what depends on what, and you're putting it in a form that is um, unambiguous. Uh, and, and that's what we look to in the model formulation phase. But with the agent-based model, and I need to emphasize this, this previous diagram was more for pretty much any sort of dynamic model. With agent-based modeling, there's this further stage of model implementation. And as I described in my boot camp just a few weeks ago from a nearby floor, um, uh, often when people come to agent based modeling, um, those who don't have much computational background um, get bowled over by, by this phase because they say, Where am I going to, how am I going to program this model? I don't know Java, you know, I don't know the net logo language. Um, I don't know, C++ for repast HPC or what have you. And, you know, I don't know how I'm going to implement the model and I want to hire a programmer. And often in my view, that's, if, if that's what someone new to modeling is worried about, they're misplacing their concerns. Because in my mind, the craft of modeling is more um, acutely needed. Um, the, the craft of modeling, the greatest challenges of the craft of modeling lie in the first two areas of this. This later phase model implementation, it does require skills, there's no question, but the more subtle, more nuanced, um, uh, trickier to develop skills um, come at the model conception and formulation stage. Um, so don't just think modeling is a bunch of computer programming, agent-based model, far from it. Um, there's, there's a lot of savviness that has to be played, go into a model, the conceptualization and the formulation stage. Um, okay, so I'm gonna dive in to those stages reflective of that importance. And first we're gonna go into the conceptualization stage, okay? And I wanna remind people about an analogy that I offered in our last class between models and maps. When you first heard this analogy, it may have thrown you off, but what I appealed to there was the fact that the models like maps are pragmatic instrumental tools and they seek to help, help us navigate the complexity of the world. Um, in large part through abstraction, through simplifying representations of the world, mimics of the world as it went, as it were. They represent abstractions that hide most of the details of the world, but give us the essential details that we need to pursue our needs. And it's this capacity to omit details that makes them useful. A map wouldn't offer much value if it had all the details of the world. It would be the world. Um, now, I argued that this has a corollary, or for those from the US, a corollary, um, that models are specific to purpose, um, uh, like maps. So, you know, if you wanna, I argued if you wanna drive across Toronto or take the transit across Toronto, or walk across Toronto or bike across Toronto, you would use a different map. If you want to figure out why electrical brownouts are occurring in areas of Toronto, you use a different map than why flooding is occurring in areas of Toronto. They're specific to purpose. Which details you leave out depends on your desired use of the mall. Um, and this is a comforting analogy but honestly, it's a bit glib in the sense that often with models, it's more tricky to figure out which information should be omitted. And the reason for that, simply put, 
is emergence. That's one of the foremost reasons for it. Sometimes we don't know that the phenomena we wish to understand or in which we wish to intervene critically involves a certain component of the model. And it requires working with the model and learning from it. So, so you know, George Fox said, all models are wrong, some are useful. Um, and a key point here is any attempt at perfect representation of the world in your model is doomed to fail. It's a fool's error. Um, and establishing a, cl a clear model purpose is, is critical for defining what's, what's included. And uh, this is particularly needed uh, because of the reduced back pressure that occurs with agent-based modeling. Um, with system dynamics modeling, we have a natural um, set of limits for what we can easily do with a model that sort of, it works to constrain us. With agent-based modeling, um, the shackles are off, the hounds are loosed, and uh, we can easily get ourselves too tangled up in details to allow us to see the forest. Um, so, you know, it, it bears noting that we really need to think about what are we trying to accomplish in the model and what are the essential factors we need for that and proceed step by step. Um, we need to think explicitly about model boundaries. And one of the key points here is less is more. Sometimes adding more details doesn't yield greater insight, particularly given limited time you have available. This is this is not obvious because you might think you just enrich it by adding more factors, but inevitably you rule out adding other things because of opportunity costs. And often you add such complexity that it's hard to hard to under harder to understand the model. So um, the flexibility, generality, and you know, complete complete versatility and computational universality of ABM supports this creation of arbitrarily rich models. And it's very easy to put the whole kitchen sink in a model. Um, for a someone who's skilled at model implementation, it's easy to put things in, but it often, what's obscured is what you're not learning by things you're, you know, by, by working with a smaller set of things or what you're ruling out by putting these things in. Um, so there's an acute need to be disciplined and be clear about what you put in. And I, I want to highlight, so when we're talking this, it, it sounds all abstract, but I'm, I want to talk about some particular examples in ABM. Like when I say it's that we have all these choices and it's very easy to throw things in, um, I want to highlight a few choices. For example, which agent types do you want to involve? Okay, so if you want Many people here are interested in communicable disease modeling. If you want to model communicable diseases, um, do you focus on population members as the only agent type? How about healthcare workers? How about clinics? How about you know those places undergoing that that undertake testing and contact tracing team? Um, what about the teams delivering vaccinations? Um, to what degree do you want to represent acute care centers as, as agents? I mean, even just the choice of agent types can be not obvious. Um, in many models, there's a question, do we expand it to family members um, or broader elements of people's social network? Um, uh, these are sometimes not easy questions uh, to answer, require a lot of, a lot of reflection. How do we characterize agent-agent interactions? Do we, do we have spatial components? Do we have networks? If so, are they static or dynamic networks? Are, are there multiple types of networks? Um, what are the structures of those networks? How much heterogeneity do I want to capture? In system dynamics modeling and compartmental modeling, adding heterogeneity is a heavyweight operation. We want to stratify our model by age, for example, and it hasn't been we have to go across the large majority of our model and stratify it. It, it. it forces us to think 
carefully, do we want to undertake this step? In a nature-based model, you add in a parameter, say representing someone's age, if it's static, or you add in a state chart to represent their age, and it scales very nicely, um, but it's more moving parts in the model. Um, and you know, there's also questions, what processes do we want to capture within an individual? Um, you know, to what degree do we want to consider decision making and preferences on the part of agents? You know, um, vaccine hesitancy, um, those that are, are, are vaccine hesitant, vaccine hostile, or vaccine welcoming, or different reasons for vaccine hesitancy. Maybe some, it's more transportation barriers. Others, it's lack of time. Others, it's, it's um, you know, a sense of apathy. Others, yet, it's a sense of, of uh, uh, you know, skepticism of, um, of the pharmaceutical system. And, and do, we, do we want to represent that? One really needs to, to, to think about, um, about these choices with agent-based models. They come up all the time with agent-based models. And I'd like to provide some, some general principles here. Okay, um, first of all, there typically exists high opportunity costs to investing in a given model area, to putting more things in. And, and the key point here is given limited time, putting one thing in will typically take away from another thing. Um, it will sometimes obscure our reasoning about it as well because it just leads to more you know, sound and fury in the model without a lot of extra uh, light, a lot of smoke, but, but little fire. Um, this is the risk. So you have, to, you have to realize it's easy to do. And there's part of you that feels it will be a benefit by necessity, but you have to reflect on the possible hidden costs. Um, it's interesting in life, there's many areas where the costs are evident, but the benefits not. And then in other spheres, it's, it's, uh, the costs are, are hidden. In others, um, it's, you know, the costs are obvious, the benefits are not. And, and often we make poor decisions about these things or, or healthcare um, and, and public health systems um, or health systems more generally make, make poor decisions. But here, um, this is something that's up to us as modelers often. Um, and so you, given this flexibility, the, the key thing is you wanna wield two logical knives. John Sturman talks about the logical knife of model purpose, and that's long been a kind of a, a lodestar for me, a, a North Star. But the other thing is time, time boxing. The fact that you have limited time constrains your, um, uh, ebullience, uh, your, your over-enthusiasm to just more, put more things in. And you should make use of time boxing. And I'm, I'm using a term from software engineering there, time boxing, to refer to specifically to the, pro, to the um, practice of maintaining small, short sprints with the model, where you say, over the next two weeks, we're going to put this in, or the next week, we're going to put that in. And you go and you put in place what you can in that time and get another running version of your model with, with those components added, rather than just letting the modeling process drag out over very long periods of time. And the key point here is to incrementally evolve model scope with learning. It's to incrementally, um, not just incrementally undertake the actions to add things, but incrementally to learn what is needed to add next. Um, and that's, that's I, I should note, somewhat different than software engineering. Software engineering, there is some learning going on, but with modeling, it's huge. We run a model, we learn new things from the observed behavior, say, I didn't know that, we show it to stakeholders, they critique that behavior, they critique the structure, and they give recommendations. And the general, principle I want to come back to is from software engineering. It's the Agni framework. You ain't going to need it. Start simple and add as one develops confidence in and understanding of model and conviction of certain things really being priority. And I, I want to, putting on my software engineer hat, I, I really want to emphasize this issue of 
agile model development. So some of you in the audience, some people here locally, some remotely perhaps will be familiar with the fact that um, there's a whole subfield of software engineering methodology called agile software development, agile model, uh, agile software, um, software development, software engineering. And um, I've long been a proponent. I think I first articulated this uh, in, a, in a very direct way about a decade ago of, of applying similar principles here um, to, to model. Um, and part of this involves building up a model in a step-by-step -step incremental fashion. Having sprints where you add some things in, you have a running model, you show it to people, show it to stakeholders, otherwise learn from it, and only then decide what to put next. Another component of agility is working constantly with stakeholders. Don't just say in another six months, we'll come to you and show you a great model. No, 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 you, you work with them all along the way and often in an embedded fashion. Um, but with each iteration, the model here is modified in some small fashion. You, you add chunks of work to it and you learn from those chunks of work. Uh, you, you, you learn from, from running the model and you learn from showing the model behavior and structure, new structure to others and getting critiques of it. Because our model, remember from last time, the models are learning prostheses. They're tools to help us learn. It's not that they embody the truth, but they speed us towards the truth by helping us spot misunderstandings or misplaced emphasis that isn't warranted. They, they more clue, quickly clue us into to aspects of our thinking that are off base. So in these steps, new model versions are produced. And often, and this goes back to some work by Axelrod and, and uh, Axtel, I think two decades ago, um, uh, a new version of the model is docked against older versions. So you create a new version, Often you disable the new behavior, make sure it behaves like the old version. Um, and, and then with enabling it, you, you continue, uh, you, you, you run it and, and observe the change in behavior from this new, this new feature, this new type, of, um, uh, new type of dynamics you've captured or new types of structure. This is super important. If you add in just a small thing, um, a small new feature, and then you run it and you compare the difference, you know where the difference came from. It came from that small thing. And that helps you learn more effectively why the model is having certain behavior. You learn when did it first start showing this unusual behavior over time or over space, et cetera. It helps you understand why the model, although even though it will get more complex, why it's behaving the way it does. Where do those dynamics come from? And these incremental versions often can be demonstrated and should be demonstrated to system stakeholders from feedback. And they produce insight that then leads you to select what to do next. And often what you do next is very different from what you would have thought you would do next, you know, a month ago or two months ago. Um, and, and importantly, and I'll come back to this point um, especially later in this course, there is a need periodically to kind of um, simplify those incremental versions, remove corrupt, remove features that are no longer needed, that aren't um, serving any material purpose anymore, any human purpose is, is in the past, they're no longer priorities, and you, you will often remove those um, and work to, to speed up the model, for example. Um, so there's a lot of benefits of incremental development. I'm not going to go into these. I've, I've kind of uh, emphasized them, but I do want to highlight one. One is this ability to diagnose problems. And, and again, this is a feature of where an agent-based modeling, the needs are particularly acute. It does arrive for other types of dynamic modeling because all types of dynamic modeling produce unexpected behavior. They produce surprises. They produce emergent behavior. 
behavior that surprises us, behavior that can't be reduced to any one piece. We model to learn, and one of the main reasons we learn is we learn, oh, if we put these factors together, we get something very different that I didn't expect. So models by their nature often will produce dynamics that we can't anticipate. I mean, almost always, we wouldn't model without that, right? Or they produce things we don't expect, things that are, that are different than what we would have thought. And because of this, um, we are often in a situation where we see new behaviors. Sometimes those behaviors are intriguing, surprising. And the key question that often arises is, is that intriguing behavior, is that strange behavior, is that surprising behavior, is it a feature or is it a bug? Is it a problem with the model design or formulation? Um, uh, so I'm using those in the same way, or a model implementation issue on the one hand, is it one of those? Or is it a problem, or sorry, or is it an emergent pattern that is genuinely coming out of this model that I have lessons to learn from? Um, obviously your responses are quite different. If this is a, a, a bug in the model implementation, you wanna go fix it. If it's a problem in the model design, you wanna rethink some aspect of model formulation. If it's a problem that is, or sorry, if it's an emergent behavior, you wanna learn from it, you wanna invest in it, you wanna figure out where it comes from. And as I say, the ability to diagnose which of these it is, is a, it's a lot easier to diagnose, to figure out what, what is the cause of this new feature if all I've done is change one or two things. I've just modified one or two things and this resulted. If it's a bug, it's probably something that was manifest in those one or two things. If it's, a, if it's an issue with um, emergence, I know what are some of the key catalysts for that emergent behavior, and I could go zero in on that. So just be aware that this ability to, to kind of step-by-step step evolve a model really helps us to learn from a model and to sort out the wheat from the chaff, to sort out the, the things that are genuine points of learning, and nuggets of, of insight on the one hand from, from problems, from bugs. If, if all you do is work on your model for a month and then run it and you see all sorts of strange behavior, it's very hard to tell what's from what. Um, so anyway, I, that's the point I wanna make here. So incremental development with an agent-based model is absolutely essential. Now, when it comes to model conceptualization, um, there's a threefold division um, that is widely applied in the system dynamics area, but really applies to other areas of system science, to agent-based modeling and to discrete event simulation uh, as well. And that is the following. It's between distinguishing things that are in one of three classes with respect to the model. So these are factors that we posit as obtaining in the world, as applying in the world, that um, have some relationship to our model as one of these three. Either they're endogenously represented in the model. In other words, they're represented in the model in a way that the model generates them. It gives rise to them. It produces them. It tells us about them compared to things that are exogenous. These are things told to the model. They're represented explicitly in the model like endogenous things, but we tell them to the model. The model doesn't tell us. Endogenous things, the model tells us. It generates them. For example, the number of people infected at any time in that model we saw last Tuesday, a week ago today. That, the number of people infected in that model at any one time as we ran it was endogenous. We don't pre-specify how many people are infected every time. It spreads, it spreads in those funky waves, right? 
spread out and at any one time we could look at a graph how many people are infected but it was generating that right exogenous things are with things we told to it we said assume this contact rate between individuals we told it only have people send messages to when they're infective that they expose people next to them that was a exogenous assumption um, we said, what was the recover average recovery time of that model? That was also exogenous. It was specified to the model. And finally, there were things that were ignored. Um, there were things that were left out of that model. Um, and typically there are. And these may be things that you're aware of in the world. They typically are. But right now, and I use that word operatively. I use that word with emphasis. Right now, they're left outside the boundary of the model. We don't put them in the model. Give me some examples from that from that model that we ran with infectious disease transmission. People in a or transmitting it to their neighbors and so on. What were some things that were left out of that model? If we think about genuine things that that are involved in disease transmission, anyone? What's something that's left out? That, that genuinely would operate when it comes to infectious disease transmission. Come on, we've all lived through two and a half years of a pandemic. We should be able to is it, give the mode of transmission. Mode of transmission, yeah. Is it, is it you know, sexually transmitted? Is it bloodborne infection? Is it respiratory? Is it surface-based? Um, sorry? Okay, yeah. So pre-existing conditions that might put somewhat greater risk of getting infected, for example. Good. What's another thing? Yeah, we. So on the chat, uh, we've got a couple of years. Good. Housing density in relation to size, spatial, and, and policy interventions from those. Good. Yeah. Um, so, so there was no, you know, when the we got large numbers of infectives, the model didn't endogenously simulate policy response that would, you know, implement mask mandates or implement, you know, uh, implement a work from home policy or anything like that. So it's exactly right. And it's not that these are fixed. For a given model, generally, these are going to evolve as you undergo incremental model development and agile processes. So things that are exogenous, maybe you will want to make them endogenous sometimes. Things that are ignored, you start to suspect maybe they're more important. Maybe you put them in exogenously at first. Um, there may be cases where you simplify the model and things that are exogenous, you say, you know, the sensitivity analysis shows this really isn't that important, or maybe it's no longer that relevant. We're no longer considering interventions of that sort, et cetera. And we take it off the table and we leave it out from now on. Uh, that is possible, that models get simplified. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Those are exogenous. Yeah. So there's a question about sort of time constants associated with things like waning of immunity or or time until recovery, for example, um, or, or latent period or incubation period. Um, for that model, those that class of things where it's exogenous. Now, you know, it's it's an interesting question, you know, because not all infectious disease models would have time until waning of immunity uh, be exogenous. Um, some might might have it tied up, for example, with whether someone is on immunosuppressants or not, um, whether someone has certain chronic diseases or not. Um, they might uh, reflect it as an aspect of endogenous behavior over the long term, reflecting aging in that person or something like that. So, so just be aware, it's not that certain features are always exogenous. It may be that the preponderance of COVID-19 models those are going to be exogenous, but just be aware that there may be some others that say, no, we're, you know, 
we want to examine the impact of of um, you know the uh, the type the variant of concern on the incubation rate and in the latent period and the recovery period you know correspondingly um, uh, or we want to we want to see how that changes in response to someone's um, uh, immune activation having having been infected or vaccinated previously, et cetera. Yeah. Um, okay, so why would you include uh, a variable in, 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 in within a model? Well, there's there's a couple factors that typically motivate this. And it's it's interesting because when I sit down with projects, uh, project teams, and I do this all the time, for this class, for the CMPD 898, for the hackathon just two weeks ago, for the for, for the incubator teams and our boot camps, um, do this tremendously during the year. Um, and we start to talk about factors. These things are just like always going through my head, this list. And those in the room who, who have interact with me in any of those settings will know that often I will engage in um, in sort of you know spewing some of these out um, to to get people to think for a given model about what it needs to include. So one factor you know that will govern whether it's in the model or not is you know do you believe it's essential for characterizing the 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 spread that that leaving it out um, that that we need to capture it in the model explicitly. Um, requires uh, having it. It's, it's not that in the world it's essential. I mean, there's plenty of things in the world that are essential that you know we're not going to capture in the model. DNA transcription dynamics uh, or, or RNA transcription dynamics or you know um, uh, dynamics associated with subatomic collisions or what have you. Like we're not, we're not going to we're not going to represent those in a model. But the question is, you know, is there something that that is so central that we really need it to have an adequate accounting. This one's um, a little bit more elusive and I, I need to express that better. But I wanna go on to these others because often they are the, the bigger ones that come up. If, if you're considering a model that you're trying to examine certain interventions, maybe you wanna have in place a healthy food intervention. So changing the food environment, you know, availability of of healthier grocery stores, or maybe it's a fresh fruit and vegetable voucher program, or maybe it's efforts to um, to uh, help educate people how to use fresh fruits and vegetables that are available uh, more effectively uh, in cooking or what have you. Um, uh, ones that have not traditionally been available in a community, but now are. Um, if you want to capture an intervention, somehow the model needs to to, to represent that effect. So if you want to have a fresh fruit, fruit and vegetable voucher that is a certain amount of money associated with it that, that provides fresh fruits and vegetables to, um, um, to, you know, money for them to families, surely you want to, the model needs to represent something about the cost economics of buying fresh fruits and vegetables so that it can be modified by this voucher. Because how else are we going to simulate the effect of the voucher? It's got to, it's got to affect their decision making about the, about food in light of the price, and so we need something about the price of food, and we need something about what they can afford, and and you know we we need to we therefore need to 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 capture this um, uh, these these factors in our model to capture the effects of fresh fruit and vegetable um, interventions. If you want to have an intervention that looks at reducing needle sharing on um, you know by by distributing distributing you know uh, clean needles and doing dirty needle pickup within communities for intravenous drug users um you need to have somewhere in the model like people sharing needles <laughs> you know you need to say something about how that's going to affect needle sharing behavior right um so often the interventions we want to capture 
we want that we want to evaluate where we want to see what their effect is with that intervention without compared to baseline on um, the status quo. We need a we need a model that has the the mechanisms in there to simulate that that is affected by this. Okay, at some level. Now, a flip side of this is if you're concerned about a factor that will be affected by an intervention. Um, uh, you know, that's, um, that's also uh, a motivation for, for putting this in. So maybe there's, um, uh, maybe there's a type of side effect you're, you're concerned about, or, or that you're interested in, you're interested in knowing, um, for example, the impacts of a needle sharing, uh, a program to reduce needle sharing through distributing clean needles and retrieving dirty needles from the community. Um, and you want to understand its effects on HIV transmission. Well, guess what? You need to simulate something about how HIV spreads, right? Like, um, because you care about that, um, uh, it's affected by an intervention. You want to understand its effect. Um, uh, really, probably this should be combined with the next one because it's associated with an intervention outcome. Maybe you're interested in how does an intervention affect people of low socioeconomic status versus high? Well, you know, you need to represent something about socioeconomic status in, in the model. Um, you know, if, if you have an intervention that's focused on fresh fruits and vegetables and you uh, vouchers, that's great. And you want to understand its impact on weight, you need to say something about how eating fresh fruits and vegetables ripples through to affect weight, a person's weight, because you want to see how it affects weight. It, the model has to simulate how it affects weight, right? Like, um, it's, it's not rocket science, but often we have to think these things through with a model. We want to put an inventory of interventions you want to investigate. Um, we want to put, uh, a set of things we're absolutely convinced need to be represented because they're so essential in accounting for what's going on. Um, another factor is, is uh, observability of something. And I, I particularly highlight things that, um, that relate to data, that, that relate to data we observe from the world. If, if we have a model and we want to develop confidence in it, Generally, there's going to be some things from this model that we want to compare with the world. Maybe it's the count of infectives. Maybe it's the count of new infectives occurring every week. Maybe it's the number of people dying from infection. Maybe it's the number of people who are who have diagnosed diabetes. Maybe it's uh, you know the count of people who are um, who are who are uh, you know tragically uh, dying from drug overdoses. Um, if, if we have model, a model that uh, we want to compare with the world to develop confidence that the model is capturing realistically the observed data from the world, we need, we will typically represent explicitly those observables, something that we can compare to the world. In other words, maybe we could have the model without an explicit count of diagnosed diabetics, but because we want to compare it to the world, we, we want to capture the occurrence in the model of diagnosed diabetics. Um, and in short, we often will end up putting things into our model that can be one-to-one -one compared against data from the world in order to in order to test our understanding that the model is doing reasonable things that we can compare and we can represent it to stakeholders in terms they understand. So, you know, the number of cases averted. Maybe, maybe we're doing a, maybe we're working with an infectious disease model. And as modelers, maybe we're thinking about how many people out there are infected and getting infected, but we need cases. We need people who are identified as, as infected to be able to compare with case data. Um, and this may be in a case where, in a situation where um, we, you know, have a big difference between number of infections and the number of reported cases. And when I say case, I'm talking about reported cases, reported by the health, the health system. Um, you know, right now, 
it's estimated in Canada that the ascertainment rate is something like one out of 100, meaning for every 100 infections, probably one is reported. I want to take that into account if you want to compare your model results, number of infected individuals against data from the world, you, you want something for case, case, you know, data that can be compared against case data, because you're not going to generally compare directly against infection data. And finally, if there's something that's required for stakeholder credibility, often it relates to these observables, but, but um, or stakeholder credibility or interests. Um, sometimes they're really interested in certain factors. Maybe they're interested in not just um, tragically uh, completed suicides, but suicide attempts, which you know, may not be recorded um, reliably within your data sources, but they're interested in that. Um, or maybe to have credibility, you need to convince them your model is, is you know, shows dynamics similar to what they're familiar with. And so you, you put something in the model. So these are all reasons why a model will contain things. Um, uh, okay, I think I'm going to, Go go less on this. We have we've limited time together, um, and and th there's some thoughts there on on endogeneity, but I actually really want to get on to a further distinction here. Um, and it's clear we'll have to sort of you know uh, wrap this up next time. So I want to describe two distinctions in models. One of them really builds on the other. It's kind of for a sub piece of the other. Um, these are really striking um, uh, striking factors within the agent base space. And you will find big differences between modeling styles of different agent based models. Uh, um, between uh, on the spectrum, between building theory building models, um, uh, these are, stylized or I like to call them stylized models. Some people call them toy models or 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 uh, caricature models that Carl Simon's comment Russ Hammond likes theory building models and I, I prefer that too. Um, I, I like stylized models. These are basically designed to help sharpen our thinking. They're designed to to kind of capture essential high-level insights about a situation. There are aha models. There are, there are models that have just very, very few fa factors often, and they give rise to some interesting emergent result that we didn't anticipate often. Um, that's on one end of the spectrum. On the far end of the, uh, the other end of the spectrum are, are theory explication models. And, here we're we're genuinely looking at a a, a specific context um, typically, and we are capturing empirical data from that context and trying to understand what does theory tell us about um, uh, what's going on in this system. On the left, we're building up our theory, we're building up our thinking about how things work in the world and. And we're doing that very explicitly with models that are very simple. We're not pretending that these models represent a situation in any one context or, or the world. We're not pretending it represents anywhere near a complete accounting. We're just, we have this little micro world and we're thinking through how do things interact to build up some understanding of what really might eventually be part of a bigger theory. On the right, we, we think we have a pretty good theory of how COVID-19 develops, its natural history of infection, how it transmits, and we're gonna build them all, a theory building model, I'm oh, sorry, a theory explication model, an ABM that's going to allow us to assess the trade-off between different types of interventions over a wide type of a set of interventions or to do capacity planning with respect to PPE, with respect to emergency room staffing and, and uh, surge capacity, with respect to, you know, uh, capacity to scale to uh, to handle uh, larger hospitalization loads, et cetera. These theory explication models 
are often very specific, very particular to a context. And these two are quite different. And you will find different practitioners of agent-based modeling on different ends of this spectrum. Um, many published ABMs live closer to this theory side. They actually probably live partway through it. Like um, in my boot camp, I cited Anna D. A. Ruth's work uh, um, at, at Drexel, um, which was very thoughtful, um, very thoughtful work, which really kind of lies in this zone, kind of, I'd say a third of the way from theory building to theory explication. Some of the work that George Kaplan and, and Sandra Galea have done, um, uh, towering figures in social epidemiology in the U.S. is more two-thirds of the way over on the right here. Um, a lot of our models are kind of over on the right, but some of our models like involving trust and the dynamics of trust, some work with oral health, et cetera, over there on the left um, that we publish. Um, but, you know, for those used during the pandemic for decision-making, they tend to be over here on the right. Um, so this is one spectrum. And um, I would particularly highlight stylized models. That model we tried last Tuesday, spread of infection, we saw waves, we, we saw islands and so on. That's a stylized model. It's a model is thinking tool. It's designed to stimulate high level insight as to the possible regimes that behavior model can have. It really abstracts away from a realistic situation. I mean, we don't honestly believe people in, are in this grid and you know just transmitting with others in the grid, but it captures some essentials, just like a good political cartoon, a caricature captures the essential features, you know, of a politician with a giant chin or or you know, with with big ears or something. It captures an essential feature about the situation that's recognizable. So it is those models. And I would highlight, if people want to explore this in any logic, there's a shelling segregation model, which is another nice little model there that basically shows in a sobering fashion, um, if you run it, uh, ways in which comparatively modest levels of preference to live near people who look like us for homophily, in other words, um, to interact with people like us um, ends up shaping macroscopic behavior. What I mean is each little person here is, is in one of these cells. The, the, the tan cells or beige cells are, are, are empty, but, but uh, people are either a red or are, are, are classed into two types, red or black. And if they have even a modest preference to live near other people like them, compared to any old person, um, compared to say someone of the opposite color, they will tend to cluster. And this emerges from it. They, the, the model dynamics involves them moving if they, with a certain probability, if they're not, if they're not surrounded by at least the fraction of people they want, they feel they'd love to, to live here, they will tend to move probabilistically. And it tends to lead to this big formation of clusters, which are eerily reminiscent of patterns we see in segregation, for example, in cities. And it's not that this represents Watts or Detroit or you know, parts of the Southern US that were traditionally highly segregated. Um, no, it, it, but it, it captures the essential features of that. And it's a very powerful tool to see how just this one effect can actually induce these high level behaviors. You don't have to appeal to residential segregation and redlining, and, sorry, to, to, uh, to predatory lo uh, loan practices and you know, mortgage practices and, and, um, and redlining and, and steering by these, um, these uh, real estate agents to explain these patterns. They can come out of a very simple rule. Another example of this is Conway's Game of Life, which you know, shows how um, you can have you know, incredible complexity emerge from very descriptively simple rules. Um, so we saw one distinction. This distinction was between theory building models and theory explication models. Models that are stylized like these um, versus ones, oops, sorry, versus ones that are, that are really 
data based and um, or data data rich and trying to characterize particular contexts and really playing out the consequences of theory. Those on the left help build theory. Those on the right help explicate theory. Now you'll sometimes hear an old canard. Um, I, I heard this, I've heard it a number of times in my career that we can't model because we don't have data. We don't have enough data to model, people will say. That's because often they're thinking about this side over here, the, the, this right-hand side, the theory explication. My colleague, Jeff McDonald, um, likes to argue, if you don't have data, you need to model even more. <laughs> That's when you really need to model because you need to build up understanding um, that's not contingent on data. And there's something deep there. Models are about a lot more than data, ladies and gentlemen. The model structure captures much more than data. The relationships between things in the model. You saw a week ago, right? We had this state chart S. People went from susceptible state to infective state. It required an infection to do that. In infective state, they exposed other people and then they would recover. And then with that final transition we added, they go back to the susceptible state. Um, that, that structure there is not just data. It's something deeper than data that shapes the outcomes. And in system dynamics, it's commonly said, structure determines behavior. And it points to a real truth that the models are a lot, uh, about a lot more than data. Even when we are lacking quantitative data, we can get great insights by capturing structure and capturing hypothesized structure as well as structure that is more confidently known. We can explore our thinking with respect to why we see certain broad features of this system even without quantitative data. So theory building is often a big need and it's underserved by modeling. There's quite a few models published of this sort with ABMs, but there are more models needed. We've done work, for example, in modeling the dynamics of trust and you know, trust in healthcare, but also trust more broadly in transactions. It, you know, you're, you're gonna be, have a real hard time if you wanna engage in theory explication with a model of trust. I mean, it's just so diverse, a set of areas, but if you capture the essential features of the situation, trust can be built up slowly, but can be lost very quickly. Trust is relational. It's between one party and another. Trust can be built very suddenly by moments of truth, et cetera. If you're willing to capture a few stylized facts, you can often get real insights from this. So theory building models have a place. And even without data, you can engage in theory building models and come away with a lot more savvy thinking. But, you know, uh, theory explication models in today's landscape are all the rage. They're of great interest. The models that have from ourselves and others that have achieved prominence in the COVID-19 area, um, in, in ABM spheres are definitely uh, over on this right-hand side. Beyond this side, though, I want to emphasize one other type of uh, uh, type of spectrum. The last was a legitimate spectrum, but I want to distinguish as well models, and, and this is this is this is a, an under commented um, area of distinction in modeling between models that are minimally endogenous and heavily endogenous. And the distinction here is particularly marked, ladies and gentlemen, marked between, on the one hand, micro simulation models, those are down here on the left, and agent-based models, uh, particularly those used for, well, for policy and decision-making, but also for stylized models. There's a, within the broad framework that might reasonably be called agent-based modeling and certainly individual-based modeling, there's two different lineages. There's two different traditions. There's two different kind of um, schools of thought or, or 
spheres out of which this modeling has flowed. One is tended to be more economics and models used um, over on the left in the micro simulation area are often used in conjunction with massive amounts of data, say in um, census departments, et cetera, it's evaluating the impacts of, of pension policies within social services, et cetera. ABMs, by contrast, come out of a tradition that's tended to have much more uh, involvement by computer scientists and physicists. And they tend to be he more heavily endogenous. And I wanna, I wanna distinguish between these. This is, this is important. For those from statistical background out there, you will find elements, you will find whispers of things that you're familiar with within your sphere here. Really heavily endogenous models are those that involve latent factors. Things that aren't directly observable, but we're not scared to put them in the model. Minimally endogenous models often focus on observables, things that are directly observed. And the relationships between these observables are hard-coded. So we might have income, for example, of a person in each successive year, and we map their income according to, to the income dynamics, the distributions we see from, from data collected by tax, you know, tax forms. Um, uh, and heterogeneities, um, say between differences in men and women's um, income dynamics are just hard-coded into the relationships of how each, each evolves. Um, uh, and uh, here, we, we will often um, be sort of explicating with these observed patterns that have been noted historically, maybe with some statistical correction, we will have a model that will sort of play those out over time um, across the population. Um, and it will put these different relationships together involving income and involving education levels and its dependence on income and age and sex, et cetera. It's all observables. We're not positing some underlying dynamics and this person is burnt out or that person has left the workplace because of stigmatization and marginalization or, or this other person is, is you know, has, has uh, some underlying, um, underlying health issue, mental health issues that are excluding them from the workplace. No, we're, we're dealing with observables. And meanwhile, on the other extreme, here we're, we're fruitfully representing, we're seeking to represent the latent structure, the sort of factors that are, that are operating under the surface. And a few things are observable, um, but, but there's this whole iceberg underneath the surface. It's really the tip of the iceberg that's observable. Um, and here we're trying to capture a kind of unifying underlying theory for why we see these distributions. What is leading to, for example, high dropout rate among, um, among those in a certain demographic category, among nurses. We're looking at what's driving that in the underlying situation, even though we don't have direct data on it. And you will find models in both these spheres. But if someone from an agent-based modeling tradition, which really prizes endogeneity, will go to a micro simulation conference, often they'll feel, you know, it's, it's it, it, in some ways it's similar concepts, but in some ways it's a very different tradition. So just be aware there there are these different traditions and a lot of models traditionally in the ABM sphere um, uh, are located at, you know, at, at either side here. And so broadly what we call ABM, individual-based modeling. And micro-simulation versus traditional ABMs are, are quite, quite distinct where they lie on the spectrum, okay? So this is, this is a, an observation about the sociology of ABM. Um, so we're running short for time, but um, just, um, 
just thinking because this uh, group um, has a particular interest and in background, many people are some background in infectious disease modeling. I want to I want to highlight, um, um, and I'm not going to say this is mixing between. It's not aggregate. Um, that, that's a, an error here. Mixing between individuals, and I, I want to use this to kind of illustrate just, you know, how many choices come in. Suppose we have a model, and we're interested in spread of, could be pathogen, it could be spread of norms, could be spread of knowledge, attitudes, beliefs. Any number of, of different types of, of spread. I, I'm, I'm, I'm mentioning it in a communicable disease context, but the truth is it comes in in many other spheres as well. Um, when we have mixing between individuals and there's contagion or effects that happen, there's many different levels at which we could represent this in an ABM model. And Hopefully this will get you to think about this issue of what do I need to represent in my model? What do I need to have in my model to answer the question? So the classic way of representing mixing between different types of individuals within an aggregate model, some people here are probably familiar with is what's called a mixing matrix. And a mixing matrix says for people say if a given, let's let's say people of a given age group, zero to four, what fraction of their contacts, or maybe it's, maybe it's children, people of reproductive age, and then and seniors, um, elders. So maybe you have the first row here says children, what fraction of their contacts are with other children versus with reproductive age adults versus with seniors or working age adults versus with seniors. And the middle column says for, for working age adults, what fraction of their contacts are with kids versus other working age adults versus seniors. Um, and each row sums up to one. It's a probability, let's say, in, in the simplest case here. Um, and there's some constraints here because you can't have, you know, Children saying 90% of my, of my um, contacts are with adults of uh, working age adults and working age adults say, I don't mix at all with kids. You can't have that, right? It's inconsistent. Um, uh, and, and so um, there's, there's a consistency requirement in terms of balancing this matrix that I won't get into. But this is a classic way of representing in a, in a compartmental model. And a model that's stratified. Aggregate, you say, now, um, one thing that this doesn't get into is size of the population. So let's suppose there's a horrendous um, infection that, that um, disproportionately has disproportionate mortality among the oldest individuals, the seniors, right? The elders. Um, uh, in that case, um, you might think, well, we should make the fraction of contacts with seniors be reflective of this, of, of this loss of life, right? That, that if, if, re if working age adults used to spend 5% of their time with seniors, and now, you know, seniors, there's only half of them still, still remaining, you know, we, we need to, um, we need to reflect that fact in the, the proportion of times. And one way to capture this is what's called a preference matrix, where each person has a certain preference for spending with amount of time with others and it, it, how much time they actually spend with people that age group depends on those preferences and how many there are. So that would be further factored out, but it's still very aggregate. Um, another way that, that you could capture this is mixing between individuals based on time spent on venues, right? So um, maybe um, I spend a certain amount of time at home, a certain amount of time at work, a certain amount of time at school or, or places in the community. And I, from that, I figure out how much time I 
interact with kids or with you know, other people of working age, this would be more detailed, right? Amongst other things, you could look at the effects of workplace closures, right? And shifting people from work to home when non-essential workers can work from home, right? Um, you could look at the effects of school closures, for example. Um, but, um, and, and it would capture additional, with the additional richness, how, how people are mixing, you could specify a mixing matrix that would correspond to this, that would be induced by it, would be emergent from this, but it captures at a much different level than a mixing matrix. Um, and um, it would allow you to examine the effects of certain types of interventions that a mixing matrix would not directly support. Another way that's more complex, yeah, it is, you know, if you have um, uh, mobility based methods, uh, methods where you have people going to different venues over time. So they're, they're, you know, spending their time during in the day going from one place to another to another. And there, you might be able to more easily record, for example, where someone was infected. Um, I was infected while I was at the school, or I was infected while I was at home. Um, you might be able to capture aspects of, of for example, the way in which um, uh, you would spread, uh, spread infection to others at each of those venues, and those venues would then spread it to others, yeah. Um, so maybe I, I got infection at home, I bring it to school, um, and I spread it at school and all those at school bring it home as well. And it can, it can spread that way. Um, Mobility-based measures would allow us to say, what if we now stop them moving to other places? Or if we had you know, more fine-grained things like quinting, um, which I don't know how big a thing it is in, in other zones, but would involve only a fraction of the school being there um, for a certain amount of time for very, very intense courses, they go home and another group comes in instead. And so basically it's a cohorting strategy um, to minimize contacts between these cohorts. So you have different cohorts at the school at the same time with very little contact in school between those contacts. But of course, contact at home. I um, mean, you could examine effects. Um, and you know, you could have mobility-based methods with preference-based mobility where people go and spend time differentially based on their preferences and, and based on school closures. Maybe they'd spend more time in the community um, at playgrounds or the school or the workplace is closed and they're they're ending up uh, spending more time seeing seeing others uh, in the community as well or what have you. So there's you know, we could have mobility-based methods where people transmit because they are co-located, for example. They happen to come together. And that, that is something that, you know, has an option for, for consideration. So next time, so we've, we've been talking about this issue of problem conceptualization. What level do we want to capture uh, detail in our model about different factors. And I drew this distinction between things that are endogenous, generated by the model, exogenous, represented in the model, but told to the model. Endogenous things are told to us from the model, and exogenous things are told to the model, and some things are ignored. Um, next, um, we're going to be talking about qualitative problem mapping, and going on to issues with model formulation. I'll be introducing uh, next time uh, something that will help you start to think through the pieces of your model, um, the different components that make up an ancient-based model. In a way, it harks back to our, to our uh, end of our first lecture together, where I talked about the pieces of the model. And we'll talk about about thinking systematically through what pieces do I need at the modern formulation stage. But that's for next time. So please, before our next meeting, um, um, see if you can fill out that survey that I sent, that 
that poll, which asks for people's interests, their backgrounds, um, uh, any project ideas they might have, because that will form a key type of input for Friday's session that I'll be helping to facilitate to help people try to form project teams across the structures of distance, okay? Um, so try to do that. And um, uh, I have the Zoom information posted in the, um, in the campus site. Any questions from online here? Yeah, yeah, because no, no. Of, uh, our model, yeah. Uh, so, sorry, so the theory of explication versus uh, theory of uh, theory building, yeah. So your question relates the, to the custom model. Custom model? Costs. And the costs. costs. Yeah. So costs, yeah. So if your model, you're seeking to understand the costs borne by a certain yeah. factor. Yeah. So, In the exploitation. well, okay, so. This gets a little bit into the sociology of modeling. Uh, there's nothing that would prevent a theory building model from incorporating like some representation of cost. It could, it could incorporate some representation of cost, but most modeling that involves costs um, uh, tends to concentrate over here because they're very interested in understanding the quantitative cost trade-offs between different sorts of say interventions or 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 policies and so for example um we've done quite a bit of work with abms uh, with cost effectiveness um there's cost benefit modeling um uh so you can compute costs in quality adjusted life years or dallies disability adjusted life years the costs and life years and um, that work is generally very much focused on getting a specific quantitative estimate about the cost burden of certain types of situations. And, and you'll examine for different interventions, how does it affect costs and how does it affect the life years lived or quality adjusted life years lived or disability adjusted life years lived. And that very much tends to be over here. Now, that doesn't mean that always the models that are used for cost-effective analysis are dynamic models. There are, in my mind, um, no shortage of, of cost-effectiveness models that should be dynamic models, but are not, um, that are static models. There's others that are perfectly legitimate. It's not a dynamic model. Um, but, um, but certainly when it comes to ABM use in with costs, this is mostly where people's ideas focus, but you could do it here. It's just on the left here, um, you're looking for broad qualitative learnings, like ahas, like big epiphanies that come from running this model. And maybe it will be, oh, um, costs, you know, we can save costs and save lives at the same time. That that might be an epiphany that would come from a model over here. And, and that, that would be with a theory building model that it would it would it would teach you a, a broad lesson, but um, it wouldn't be telling you something about. In fact, for a realistic context in a realistic situation, in a particular situation in the world, you could both save costs and save lives. It just it introduces that possibility that aha, I never thought of it that way before. So you could put costs over on the left. It's just. It's not nearly as common. Yeah, I hope that's that's helpful. Yeah, do people who care about costs tend to be particular about how much it costs, <laughs> and so so they they will tend to want a model where you know other things are pinned down in a particular circumstance. They, you know, it, it wouldn't be fair to say that that it's entirely bean counters that care about costs. Far from it. Lots of people care about costs for other reasons, but they tend to be quite particular about, you know, um, is this gonna be cost positive or cost negative? Is it gonna be cost savings? Is it gonna cost, you know, an arm and a leg or, or a modest amount? And for the most part, that, that's gonna be in the context of models that are more that are more data driven. Any on, online questions that I could address? 
Any online questions? I'll I'll stop the screen share here and just go. Um, I'll just look. Um, yeah, uh, policy interventions. Yes, structural change. Good mutations. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, okay. Any any questions people would like to ask online? But we'll switch to office hours here in just a minute. Okay. So um, uh, thank you, and uh, I will look forward to seeing you folks on Thursday. I am probably going to give you a bit of a challenge um, posting um, to the uh, site. So I'll probably give a, um, a take-home exercise that I'd like you to struggle with a little bit um, to try out some of these concepts we've explored today, okay? And we'll... Uh, I'll we'll try to take a look, uh, discuss the results together on uh, on Thursday. In other words, we'll we'll discuss um, uh, some some uh, reflections on that problem on Thursday. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording, and we will switch to office hours. Thank you.